Graffi, we're going to have a dialogue that's going to be part of our Collective Intelligence series. And we've talked about a lot of concepts on the channel uh, which have become quite important to people trying to kind of follow the thread of this conversation. Things like coherence, sovereignty, um, some people talk about Game B, um, but definitely collective intelligence, collective insight. And I've kind of realized as we've been doing these, um, making these, making these films, that a lot of these concepts are things that I learned from you. We, we go back about 10 years almost, almost now. Yeah. Um, and you're kind of full disclosure, you're a mentor to Rebel Wisdom, you're a very close friend. And I've kind of realized that a lot of your um, frameworks of looking at the world have kind of also become very useful and very important to me, making sense of the world. And I think they align really nicely with a lot of what some of the interviewees on our channel have been talking about, like the nature of coherence, the nature of collective intelligence. What I would say is a lot of, when I dig into these concepts, there are things that I'm familiar with and that I know, but they've kind of gotten new names and labels recently in this sense-making conversation that's happened. So I have to kind of reflect on it a little bit, reframe it, use the new language, and I just hope that I have come away with it with a deeper understanding and that we create a coherent field here and that we feel what is, for me, the real, the most important element of measuring coherence or autonomy or sovereignty, which is contact. And once we get into contact and we're, we're communicating from a very, let's say, real and honest perspective, things emerge you know, so emergent conversations happen, and we can have a little experience of some collective intelligence right here. Let's do our best. Okay, we try. <laughs> and I know you've been following and listening to quite a few of the other people on the channel, and what have you made of it so far? Well, I am really amazed at how smart some of these people are. I have to say, and the way that they can articulate it and take it apart, and it's like, it's sort of like pause, rewind, listen again sometimes. So there's a lot of intelligence. I find some of it, I have to listen quite carefully to it. But there is also sometimes use of terms like sovereignty and coherence as though they're like, yeah, you know, I just, I lost my sovereignty for a moment, so I have to go back to sovereignty or coherence. And I find those from the personal growth aspect and the spiritual development work that I've done to be very sophisticated states in which I spent a, a lot of time kind of not working on explicitly on autonomy, but autonomy, let's say, coming a, becoming an outcome of a lot of other work of digesting and metabolizing my own personal history, beliefs, concepts, mm -hmm. the, the cultural stuff that was put into me that I just take as rote truth when I'm young and trusting and as I grow up and start living my life and start finding that I'm running into walls, then I start to question things. And so I guess what I would say in general about a lot of it is that the cerebral part is really great and I'm so blessed, I think, and that you are able to have these sophisticated conversations with these people, but the actual work is a lot deeper than just sitting around and understanding a concept. Mm -hmm. Because we do have a shadow, and we do have a big unconscious, and we have a lot of repressed material. We've been <laughs> extremely influenced by the culture that we grew up in, by the parental society, the parental influence, and the personality that we developed, which in my way of looking at things is kind of a psycho-spiritual lens, is not the truth of who we are. But to get to the truth of who we are, I have to start with where I am, and where I am is locked into this personality, which behaves in a very conditioned way, and I have to be very curious about it. And I have to be very willing to share the truth as it comes up in me with other people so that it, it kind of gets metabolized as it becomes more conscious. And then those terms, oh, this is a moment where I would be usually, let's say, completely um, influenced by somebody else's presence. And actually, I'm not. I'm still sitting here with myself. You know, I noticed a certain kind of autonomy then.
mm-hmm. you know, but it's a process. And so the, da- the only danger, I think, is exposing people to really high level ideas and then people thinking, oh, I understand sovereignty, um, you know, it's unto yourself. And to me, when I really think of sovereignty, which I usually use the word autonomy rather than so- sovereignty, but I see them as very closely related. Autonomy is, feels a little bit rounder and sovereignty feels a little bit more vertical and hierarchical maybe because it's related to like sovereign beings like kings and stuff like this. But the, the thing that um, comes out of autonomy is really real human contact. And I feel like more than even like spiritual enlightenment, I'm really craving and going for real human contact in my life. And that in itself turns out to be spiritual. And I find myself transforming in that. So I'm not much on transcendence. I find transcendence has a subtle level of rejection in it, maybe on an overt level. I'm more into like loving the truth and going into the uncomfortable places and talking to people that are good friends of mine and bearing our souls a little bit and grinding it out. I like it. Mm. There's two things that came up. One was reminded that a phrase that I've heard you use a few times before about the personality, like you've got this sort of dialogue between what I call the essence and the personality that you're familiar with from many kind of spiritual traditions. Like if you look deep enough inside, you'll find the essence and there's various maps that talk about that. Um, But I've heard you say before that your personality is not wrong or your ego is not wrong. It's an intelligent strategy to survive in the environment you grew up in. So it's not wrong, it's just out of date, which I think is Sorry that I said your best line, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just impressed that you remembered it precisely. Yeah, but what I love about that is that there's no rejection in that. Because yeah. the only way to transform is to accept. And the paradox of that is that if we're trying to change ourselves, we won't be able to change ourselves. It only comes through integrating and accepting these parts of ourselves. Right. So when I do my work, I, really, I, I, I make that pronouncement, and you've heard me do it a number of times to a group that this is a place where you're not going to be judged. You know, you fixated in a personality. And that was a, a, a confluence of many different elements from your parental, your school, your any traumas that you went through, whatever, and you survived. But you fixated into something that's basically designed to avoid danger and damage and further trauma in that environment. And then we take that as who we are, and that becomes what we call our ego, our personality structure, it's the I that we relate to. And then we find that it's very limited in terms of its functionality. It's fine if you just keep living in the same box, but if you have this kind of urge and desire for more, you have to start taking that apart. And the only way that I see that's effective for that is to not be judgmental towards any person wherever they find themselves. And I find that very easy to do and, and to point out, okay, that was an intelligent thing to believe in when you were a kid, but does it really serve you right now? And then we enter into an inquiry process and we bore down into it a little bit and people start to, as they become aware, you start to have choice. And before you're aware, we're on automatic pilot, more and more robotic, and we just do things. And we fill the space with, you know, automatic behavior. Yeah, and I want to go back as well to what you talked about with sovereignty. And the danger with thinking that sovereignty is something simple that we can, like, oh, I was out of my sovereignty, and that you can maybe learn it, or just even by understanding the concept, that can make some significant difference. No, sovereignty is all of our, it is going to be linked to all of our childhood stuff, all of our conditioning from society and from family, and it's a huge, huge piece. It's a lifetime's work just in itself, I guess. I think so, and I see it that way. And it's not like you suddenly arrive there and it's done. I think you can become more and more sovereign or autonomous as new influences come into your field and challenge any old concepts or beliefs. It's basically not being bound by old concepts and beliefs that came from anything external to you. 
So it's a very self-realized place where you sit in relaxed confidence with yourself that you have inside of yourself what it takes to respond to anything that comes from the outside. That's sovereign. But when I find myself losing my sovereignty, when I find myself losing my grounding, when I find myself in a contraction because I'm somewhere comparing myself to somebody else or somebody has criticized me or something, the way to deal with it is to be really, really curious about myself. And then with that curiosity and the process of inquiry, going into and just bringing it up, raising it up to the surface. Whoa, oh, there's an old piece I never looked at before. There's an old concept. And somehow it gets metabolized when it gets brought up responsibly. Mm. You know, so, yeah, sovereignty. Yeah. And, and it can be very um, easily, I think, mistaken for, yeah, I'm, a, I'm sovereign, man. Mm. Are you really? Yeah, and I wanted to kind of bring something in as well. I've had that experience, like becoming curious of what, what's coming up or any negative reactions or any kind of emotional reactions is something. So I, I went through a, a period of doing a lot of transformational workshops. Some of them I did with you. Some of them I've done with various different kind of facilitators. And what I found after a while was, um, and I've used this phrase on our workshops, like becoming a detective of our own experience and following the thread of, something would come up. So if you're on a two or three day workshop, maybe someone will say something that sparks a thought or you'll have an experience where you'll, that will simmer for like a couple of days. And becoming, like, becoming enjoying that when you feel like, oh, I'm feeling angry about something, or I'm feeling touched by something, getting excited about that as a, as a feeling of, oh wow, I'm ready to realize something about myself. And then following the thread and almost unraveling the thread of that experience and finding that it almost always emerges into some kind of realization, oh, it was that experience that was, that was coming up, or it was that relationship that I'm ready to look at in a new way. And I guess for people who are not so familiar with kind of the idea of workshops, I mean a, a four or five day, maybe even a two day process, which where we've just got a chance to play with different parts of ourselves, be more honest than we normally would be. And yeah, it, it's, it's sort of a much more open space to, to kind of explore what's going on. What, what do you make of that, that sort of sense of becoming a detective of our own experience? I think that that's a wonderful phrase, and I'm going to steal it and start using it in my groups, um, because I think that the, the basis of inquiry uh, is curiosity. And inquiry, I want to break down the word inquiry for a moment, because I think it's such an important method of self-discovery. Inquiry literally means to question. And to question means I don't know. And to not know brings us out of the kind of certainty of our personality structure and that lens that we wear. So we, bec we come in a kind of liminal space of not knowing then, and we become available to truth. And if we can get excited about that, if we can add that element of inquiry, and I'm really curious, What's going to happen if I follow this thread? Even it feels really uncomfortable right now, or I got really defensive last night, but I'm curious about why did I get really defensive, and I stay with it. I really trust that there is, has been known in humanistic psychology for a long time, there's this optimizing force for self-realization inside all of us, and if we get aligned with that, and we support that, it is going to bring up what we need to know. Yeah, and one of the other things that's talked about by a lot of people is the idea of coherence. And I guess collective intelligence, collective insight is sort of based around that coherence. But one of the mistakes I think a lot, I see a lot of people making, and this is something Jamie Wheel uh, mentioned to me the other day, and I'd like to record something with him about it, is this sort of idea that, oh, we can just go into coherence. Let's, let's kind of really try and go into coherence. And that doesn't work. Coherence is, is from what I understand and what I've experienced, it's, an, it's, what we, it's the space we get to on the other side of um, the difficult conversations or the work or the kind of once we've gone through whatever's coming up that's keeping us out of coherence, then we can arrive in that space. We can't shortcut there. Like it's a kind of emergent outcome of having done the work deeply enough to be in that kind of coherent space with each other. Would you agree with that? 
totally. I mean, I think it's another one of those kind of catchwords right now that can have a very simplistic understanding, but I see it as an outcome. And it's, a, it's, and the interesting thing about coherence is I, I'm cohe I can become coherent with myself by telling the truth. I can become coherent with a group of people by everybody sharing their truth and we come to a certain kind of appreciation and single-mindedness or whatever you want to call it, a level of contact with each other, but we're not the same. And there's, there is a kind of coherence where everybody listens to a piece of music and maybe they become coherent in a, on a wavelength level that can be measured by heart math or something like that. But the coherence that I'm thinking of in a more active group is everybody's in, indiv they're in their truth and they're sitting in their truth as individuals and out of that comes a space that is very tangible that, that is, that's exciting also because we're on the edge of something, we're in contact. Every, it doesn't mean we're in agreement, it doesn't mean we're saying the same thing, but everybody's opened themselves up. And so I think that the real um, doorway to coherence is telling the truth and being honest. Yeah, and that kind of goes in and out as well, like it's speaking the truth, but it's also being alive to what's emerging in ourselves and wanting to be known. Because I'd say if anything has fueled um, the, the growth of rebel wisdom so far, and it's, it's, the, it's that um, we've tried to live out those values. Like, yeah. I've kind of, we've internalized those values over a long time of being in kind of workshops together and seeing the effect of that speaking the truth, how it kind of creates more flow and creates more contact and more connection, is trying to live that out in our, in our interactions with each other, knowing if something's coming up which is a practice I do with Ali all the time. Ali also uh, trained with you quite a bit. Um, that whenever something is kind of coming up for each of us, we try and clear it and we try and keep the field as clean as possible between us. The field, the concept of the field, I think is something I'd like to go into as well because I think that's really useful. Um, but I think that if, if anything has, yeah, I think that hopefully is kind of, coming across in the, in the work that we're doing and in the energy of the, the, the stuff that we're putting out from the kind of courses to the, to the videos to, uh, it is that, that we're trying to live out and do the work that we're kind of making the films about as well. Yeah, and I, I think you wouldn't be having the success and the following of people if that wasn't coming across. If you were just working with abstract ideas and it was just another headspace, it'd be, oh, oh. But the fact that you guys actually share and it gets personal and it's embodied and you walk the talk in your life gives you some gravitas that makes the whole thing go a bit deeper. And I wanted to say as well, like, I think you have a very um, direct and intuitive grasp of where we need to go in terms of like where the culture is and what it's missing. Because I've heard you sort of say this before, it's like if we just keep going there from, from here and we see that playing out in so many areas from politics to business to like this, it's just heady, intellectual, and is sort of playing out. What's the deeper layer that you've experienced that you think is missing in the world? Well, it, it touches on a lot of points, what you're saying right now, but one place I would go to it is the difference between connection and contact. Connection can happen very, very easily, and it can be, we can feel connected because we belong to the same political party or we endorse the same ideas, et cetera, et cetera, and we feel connected, and it's a nice feeling, it's better than feeling disconnected, we could call ourselves friends, et cetera, but you don't really come into the dimension of real contact until you're really like kind of naked with the truth with another person. And I, that's what I think needs to happen. So we have to get out of hiding behind the polarizations and identifications that we have in politics. And it's only when we really start telling the truth that really the solutions that can come through are greater than the sum of the parts. Because I think we have the possibility of tremendous intelligence and wisdom arising from us, but we have to go to a place inside of ourselves where it can come forth. And so far, what we mostly have is just, 
you know, I've been waiting for the synthesis to happen for so long. You know, there's thesis, antithesis, and supposedly synthesis is going to come out of it. And it just hasn't happened. It's like the polarities just get stronger and more entrenched in their ideologies and just stuck. You know, and so I'm hoping that some of the work that you're doing and some of the thinking that a lot of these people are doing and what we're doing in the, in the group space where we're really honoring people to open up in the way that they do, can give birth to a collective intelligence that will start to come forth with new ideas that will attract other people and people will come together to live in, with different values and change can happen because, and right now I feel it's, you know, it's really time for some change. <laughs> yeah, and I want to talk a little bit about the men's work because you've been very kindly mentoring us in the men's work. We've been doing retreats for a couple of years that started very, it was kind of separately from the media channel um, as a sort of separate strand of, of rebel wisdom. I've got a couple of questions. I mean, the first one is why do you think, what do you think is necessary? What, what is men's, what's required from men's work now? And is it any different from when you were growing up? I mean, we're currently in a kind of very in interesting conversation that's happening around gender, which makes it a little bit more delicate. But in essence, I think it's the same, you know, and I, I think because I still um, I lead these groups called Essence of Masculine and Feminine. And I start off and I put it in a little bit of historical context. And I talk about the women's movement and how much it affected me and what I went through during that time. And then I talk about what I see happening right now in the gender world. And then I say, but, and I'm going to use a very binary language model to teach what I think is really important here. But my vision is, is bigger and broader than that. But and that binary one is really to look at and see if we can bring a state and find a state of relaxed confidence for a man as a man and a state of relaxed confidence for a woman in her feminine, let's say, you know, and then being home there. I guess some people might be wondering what does that even mean? What does it mean to be at home in your male side and how would, what would it mean not to be at home there and how would you get to be at home? Well, what it would mean to not be there would be that I would I, I would not be grounded. I would be in my mind. I would be compensating for a feeling of deficiency as a man. I would have received a wound, not literally castration, but figuratively and energetically. I would be castrated. I would be cut off from my male essence, and I would be probably stuck in a kind of boyish mentality, which was out trying to please and damage control the environment, and particularly women, in order that nothing bad would happen, which almost always ensures that something bad will happen, because I don't know anything that women hate more than men who act like boys. So it's getting a man to deal with his own personal issues. And I find in men's work, you know, men can come to that place where they feel something that they can definitely identify as, oh, this is my masculine essence. I can feel it, and I can feel it in you, I can feel it in me, I, and I love it. And they have to go through a bit of a process to get through that. The same on the feminine side. Feminine, the wound is not castration, but you could use the word castration, but it's more devaluation. I feel the feminine has been devalued for really, really a long time. And so women out of their intelligence, a lot of times, and because of the devaluation to the feminine, just became better men than the men. And their masculine side took over and it's become something called animus possession. And, you know, faster, smarter, quicker, better than any guy. And going to the healing of the loss of value in the feminine is a very beautiful journey. And I love to, as a man, 
I love to be able to hold this male space, be grounded in this male space, and be able to work with women and help them move into allowing themselves to feel comfortable with their own femininity and express it however it wants to come across. You know, and, it, and then the conversation that can happen between men and women. So in the last few months, the, there's certainly been a sort of trajectory on the inquiry that we've been on as the channel, and also the sense of a lot of people on a similar inquiry. Um, John Viveki, I'm thinking of in particular, focused a lot on what is wisdom, how, how does that fit together with like cognitive science, and he's now honing in a lot on um, what you might call intersubjective dialogue, the sort of, because he sees the, um, what we've lost from the sort of Greek philosophers, we've kept a lot of kind of the ideas, but what we've lost is, because actually philosophy for them was a process of discovering the truth together. And the, there's lots of words for it, intersubjective dialogue, uh, some people have called it like we spaces. You've been doing these practices and teaching these practices for like 40 odd years. What do you think is really, what, what's so useful about them and what do you think are the key uh, ingredients that we need to do them? I think that that self-discovery process is something that has some key components to it that can be taught and it takes a little bit of time to get it. And one I spoke about already is curiosity. It takes courage to have those kinds of conversations. So you might have to work through your issues around curiosity, your issues around courage. It takes um, a love of the truth. It takes a certain self-compassion for the way that you've been raised and the fixation of your personality. And it takes, a, and it takes curiosity. Those, are, I would say, were the five main elements that have to be active inside of somebody to be really able to raise, take questions and have a generative conversation with another person. I think, and I always have to, you know, because I live in a, in a kind of small world in a certain way, but I have the sense that more and more people are taking on these kind of questions and willing to look and questioning and it's all part of the what's called sense-making crisis and a lot of people like mm. really looking at themselves and my hope is, is, is that um, millions of people will start doing that and, and, and I think it happens in a way in dire direct relationship to the breakdown of the status quo structure that supports the old structure and it's good enough and we just get by. So we do need a little bit of calamity and disturbance on the side to kind of wake ourselves up. And I, th I do see that happening right now. Mm. I think the rebel wisdom is a great, um, it's just timely. So there's lots of things that we could have talked about. I know that we could have, yeah, that there's many more hours and I hope that we, uh, this is the first of many and we'll kind of dig into some of these other topics over the next year or so. But um, thank you, Rafia. And should we go and get a beer? Thank you, David. Let's go get a beer. <laughs> Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.